Recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, this is Stages to Success. The drive to excel is universal, as is the pride in a job well done. Whether you're staring down a decision maker for a multi-million dollar contract, a television camera or microphone, a negotiating adversary, or an irate conductor, the pressure to perform can be exhilarating and exhausting. Join me and meet great storytellers from music and business. Today's episode tells the story of Grant Cooper, formerly the music director of the West Virginia Symphony in Charleston. Grant was born in New Zealand and still concertizes there, but has spent the majority of his professional career in the United States. We began by speaking about how we met when he came to the Buffalo Philharmonic as a substitute fourth trumpet player. You know, I got thinking about talking to you for this episode. I had this note from a long time ago to talk to... uh, well, to, to a guy who made his living as a conductor, and, and you're not the cartoon character of the maestro from Seinfeld, right? You're a, a, a really approachable and, and nice guy and competent guy, and, you're, and yet I remember you know, meeting you in the fourth chair of the Buffalo Philharmonic, I think around or dur- during our New York State tour in 1988. Um, you were substituting for Charlie Gleaves, right? Was I even alive in 1988? Yeah, I, I think I you were remember. alive. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was teaching at the State University of New York at Fredonia, which is about an hour down the throughway from, from Buffalo. Um, so Buffalo was really our, our major cultural resource, and I was really happy that both my wife and I were able to start doing some substitute work with the Philharmonic. And Charlie, I mean, for people who don't understand this concept, uh, and, and actually it's an antiquated concept now, Charlie was our fourth trumpet player, but he was a core member, which the non-music listeners won't understand, but that's a, that's a fully vested uh, member of the collective bargaining agreement. That's very deep section for us. For that's a right. I, I think um, along the throughway in New York State, you've got Buffalo, then you've got Rochester, and then you have Syracuse, uh, three professional orchestras, and each one modeled... uh, themselves differently from the other. And you could count on the number of wins on what it was. So in in Syracuse, for example, they had triple wins. And you've just pointed out that Charlie's position of four trumpets was unusual. Mm -hmm. But it was unusual in Syracuse to have triple. Rochester only went with double wins in their core. And uh, and as a result, they had more positions to offer to string players. Can you imagine the Charleston Symphony in West Virginia having four core trumpet players? I mean, it's unthinkable. Absolutely unthinkable. (laughs) That's right. When you were teaching at SUNY Fredonia, uh, I, I assume you were already conducting there. You weren't probably teaching trumpet. You were a conductor. No, I actually was hired there to be professor of trumpet. And, no kidding. Um, I had a, and a kind of an interesting resume because it was scattered with um, titles and positions that looked like I conducted. For example, I was the assistant director of bands at Yale University. And um, I didn't conduct a note. Uh, my position there was, was based on the fact that I was a trumpet player and the, and the director of bands, Keith Bryan, was a flute player. Mm-hmm. So he wanted somebody who had um, expertise and, and knowledge in, in the brass area to uh, help those very, very bright Yale undergraduates to, um, to achieve uh, the, their, their musical goals, even though they didn't have a lot of training on, on their instrument necessarily. Well, that explains so, the Keith Bryan connection. I played many times for Keith, and, and for our non-music listeners, he does a, a shtick concert where he dresses as John Philip Sousa. It's, it's highly researched. He gives a Sousa concert, and that must be where you started as his cornet soloist. Is that right? That's right. We, uh, we were playing in Woolsey Hall at, at Yale University to about 50 to 100 people, if we were lucky, on each of our concerts. And uh, Keith came up with the idea that he could maybe get more interest from the public if he were to recreate, in an historical way, an actual Sousa concert. And at right. that time, back in the 1970s, 
there were still members of the original Sousa band alive, many of them living in New York City. Oh, my. And he and I uh, traveled down there. We did a lot of research at the, uh, at the Yale Library as well and um, found out a lot of really interesting things. Maybe the most important thing to, to bring to your listeners is the idea that Sousa didn't conduct on his recordings very much at all because he was concerned that um, that would cut into his live concert um, at, uh, attractiveness, if, if, you will, if you will. And as, as a result, um, people like his cornet soloist, Herbert O. Clark and Arthur Pryor and, and, and others, actually conducted on the recordings uh, with a very few exceptions. The other thing we found out is that the way the Sousa marches in particular were were published, which is to be marched, was not at all the way the Sousa band played them. In fact, the Sousa band on tour played thousands of concerts, and I believe the number is something like six times total they actually marched. Uh, so they played the Sousa marches, though, as, as quick-fire encores to the pieces in the program. So there might really? be four or five pieces listed. But after each um, piece uh, was played, the applause would be immediate. Of course, Sousa would turn around, and he would just uh, mouth, Post, meaning Washington Post. And then when he turned back to the band, give a downbeat, and the whole band would be playing from memory, probably, the Washington Post. And then he'd turn around and bow, and then he'd say, um, uh, glory of the Yankee Navy. And, and bang, the glory of the Yankee Navy comes comes uh, raining down. And that's why um, Susan marches often begin with dum da dum da dum da dum da yep. dum right. uh, That kind of sing-songy refrain, but also not actually defining a particular key immediately. And that's so that it, he could put them in any order and they would have a kind of a nice musical musical flow. Oh, the other thing we discovered, though, talking to the players that actually played them, is that they treated the, the, the marches more like we might treat in modern-day parlance uh, Dvorak's Salonic Dance. It was right. a really beautiful, elegant piece. And indeed, they never played tutti like the marching version of them is, is suggests where everyone's playing all the time uh, there are not very many rests in anyone's part in a uh, in a Sousa march right, as it's typically published but they didn't do that and they changed the octave of the clarinets they had a solo cornet on a line somewhere a, a big um, woodwind feature was often in, in the middle of it and indeed all of these details are in most of the marches but you just never hear them mm -hmm. because because they're, they're covered up by everybody playing fortissimo from beginning to end. So that was a real, real interesting um, musical discovery, which, which I have taken with me for my entire professional career and, and created arrangements for the West Virginia Symphony, for example, of, of Sousa marches, which I say are in the style of the way Sousa would have performed them himself. Why do you think that the cornet as a solo instrument sort of dead-ended at some point, right, right after his career, and, and the trumpet completely took over. We had Susan Slaughter as one of our first guests, for instance, and she talked a little bit about doing some of those what we call flash trash pieces on cornet because that was the virtuoso instrument. Can you enlighten yeah. us a yeah. little there's, bit there's there? A famous letter, there's a famous letter that Herbert O. Clark wrote to Eldon Benge, who became famous as a manufacturer of trumpets, um, really poo-pooing the trumpet. Saying, you just don't want to play that instrument. It's it's a horrible, um, horrible thing. The cornet is the true, uh, true um, singer of the brass family. You, you might have said or something like that. So, um, <laughs> the funnily enough, though, um, the whole scene of, of music changed, didn't it? It changed with recordings. Sousa was right in that regard. That recordings would completely change the appetite for for live music, um, and uh, and and. I guess too there were there were trumpet players that could um, demonstrate on the instrument itself that it could be just as flexible, just as fluid um, as the as the cornet. So the the difference between the trumpet and cornet is something that, that may not be immediately apparent to to our listeners. Uh, basically, you can have a a brass instrument that is tapered from beginning to end, like the horn or the tuba is. So it starts out with a very narrow bore and flares out to the bell gradually over its whole length. Or you can have a cylindrical portion of the bore, maybe up to 50% of it, where the, the taper doesn't change at all. It's like just like a tube, a pipe. Right. And the trumpet and trombone are in that family. And what happens when you make that different design happen is that the, the more conical instruments, like the tuba, like the horn, like the cornet, sound more mellow, have a more mellow sound. Right. 
the, the trumpet and the trombone have a more incisive sound. These are just sounds that were, were not possible on the cornet at all. So, so musical taste changed, and the, and the trumpet ascended. Well, I, you know, I, um, I think about the standard repertoire, and really there's the, there's the big cornet solo in the Symphony Fantastique of Berlioz. There's the Swan Lake big cornet solo. Otherwise, nothing really comes to mind. Maybe the post-horn solo. Is that a cornet one in the Mahler? Um, well, the post-horn is a unique instrument, and so people solve that one in their, in their own way. Um, but uh, and the cornet solo in Symphony Fantastique was added after the piece was actually written. I believe it was added to accommodate the talents of um, Arban, who, who really? wrote the most famous cornet method. Um, personally, I don't. <laughs> you'll find this funny as a as a former trumpet player myself. I don't ever use that cornet solo in in the piece because I I feel that like it it doesn't really help, um, and in some ways just just gets in the way of of the original musical thought. So. Even though that is a famous uh, solo, um, m- my personal taste is is to go back to the original. The first time I ever heard that played, in- interestingly, was at Tanglewood the year I was there in 1978, and um, Sergio Zawa was conducting the Fellowship Orchestra, and he had never heard of the fact that there was a cornet solo. Really? And so the librarian uh, hand copied it out and gave it to the guy playing the um, first cornet. Uh, and uh, and and that's the first time I actually heard it live. Uh, but it was interesting that that Ozawa himself had never actually come across this this piece, even though I, as a cornet player or a trumpet player, was was very very aware of it. So I'm 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 kind of proud to say that even though I was a player of the instrument, I I was not seduced. Wow! By, by this added, added added solo, you could get other, kicked the, out of the, the club place, for that. By the way, is um, Petrushka is the original. Uh, the cornet solo, the ballerina's dance. Yes, um, that's written for cornet originally. Oh, um, and there are funny there are funny um, stories about um, uh, about the cornet and the trumpet, and one of them revolves Igor Stravinsky. He was he was recording um, his soldier's tale, right? And um, the, the the royal march. That that little. Solo there was being played by Robert Nagel, I believe, um, and uh, they they were in New York City in the recording session, and there was a discrepancy about whether or not that should be articulated, tongued, or slurred, all those fast notes. Yep. And uh, this, as the story goes, um, Robert Nagel went up to Stravinsky and said, "Maestro, should I tongue this or slur it?" And Stravinsky said, "Are you playing it on cornet or on trumpet?" And Robert Nagel said, "Well, I'm playing it on the trumpet." And he said, "Well, tongue it then." Really? And that, that that's just—I mean, it just—it just goes to show uh, that that it's a lot of these decisions and things that become tradition, and of course, the recording became the tradition, and now everybody tongues it. Right. Um, uh, came came a, came about through really modest means, and perhaps not even musically justifiable means. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in Stravinsky's mind, he, that's that that was for him. It helped him understand the difference between the cornet and the trumpet, I suppose. Okay. Um, but 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 to come back to your original question, the, the the instruments have become very similar in terms of the technique of playing them, and and we don't have any difference of of um, of, of repertoire really, because um, there are a lot of cornet solos that are played on the trumpet, yeah. and um, and vice versa, I assume. So to um to 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 back out of to back out of the brass instruments here for a while you uh you're you're from New Zealand I remember you speaking um from the stage when I played with you in the Syracuse Symphony about sound of music sound of music yeah that your that your mother had actually been a a soloist in that tune that's why it stuck with you right is is uh is there is there more musical family background here for you as a kid growing up in uh, New Zealand? Well, I think I had two important influences. One was my mother, and I probably made a joke when I was introducing um, Climb Every Mountain about the fact that when one sees one's mother be Mother Superior on stage, okay. it changes one for life. I think that was probably one of my little lines that I had there. But my mother was an opera singer. She sang as a soloist with the um, New Zealand Opera Company. Okay. 
and um, she also did theatrical work like like The Sound of Music. And that, w- that was hugely important for me because I was actually seeing my mother both as, a, as my mother, as an ordinary person, but then as a really communicative musical artist on stage. Right. And uh, I think that left me with a really strong sense of uh, lyricism yep. in, in my musical mind, and I tried to bring that to my trumpet playing. The other important influence was my uncle, uh, my mother's sister's husband, who was a initially a cornet player in one of the brass bands in New Zealand, and then ultimately um, took up the trumpet and played in a dance band. And for some reason, his playing just uh, really did something for me, and uh, I wanted to be a trumpet player just like him. So one Christmas, under the Christmas tree, there was a there was a trumpet. Okay, how old were you? From my uncle, I was uh, about nine, I think. Okay. And uh, and he said, but I'm not going to teach you until you've had at least two years worth of piano lessons. Boy. And uh, Good boy. at the time, I, I, I really hated him for that. But in re- retrospect, I think it was some of the best advice I'd ever ever gotten. Right. And uh, even though I don't play the piano, or for that matter, the trumpet anymore in public, um, the the lessons that I learned by um, having having that keyboard in front of me and seeing the relationship physically, the relationship of intervals and um, half steps to whole steps and, and, and so on, uh, was was really, really helpful. When you came up through the, the food chain, you, you, the, the piano was a uh, the piano was a tool. The trumpet was your you know expressive device. At, it seems to me I remember one of the first conversations it was either with you or one of my other uh, another friend of mine from New Zealand. Weren't you like a do-it-yourself home repair guy too? Is that, am I remembering that right? Well, I think you could. You, you could apply that to almost any New Zealander at all. Um, we, we are, as a nation, well known for the fact that we like to, to do it ourselves. And no matter what it is, whether it be changing the oil on our car or, heaven forbid, doing the wiring in our house, yeah, uh, we tend to just jump in and, and, and get it done. And, why, why is uh, that? I mean, do you have so few people there that everybody has to have 10 jobs? And what, what's Because what's, <laughs> I've heard that now from almost from every person from New Zealand that I've known as I've grown older. Oh, yeah, right now I'm, you know, I exactly, I'm rewiring my house or I just changed out all the plumbing. I was like, I, you did or a plumber did? Yeah, no, no. And I, and I did all those things, too. We had a house in Fredonia that was a perfect do-it-yourself fixer-upper. And so I stripped it down to the studs and and put in a bathroom and, and, and wired it and probably shouldn't have, but I did. And wow. The house is still standing, by the way. It's uh, it's doing rather well. Well, good, because unlike a lot of DIYs that burn down from wiring that isn't up to code, uh, you, yeah. um, we, you mentioned in our, our back and forth that you didn't actually head off to university as a music major. Um, w- w- so what was your... An, you know, initial career goal with with uh, college, and what brought you here to the U.S. Once that was done, that's a that's a that's a big chunk of of my life story right there. But I guess the uh, beginning of it is that uh, the New Zealand education system, at least at that time, was was very academically oriented, and there was no question of my going to university in order to become a musician because there was no real work for musicians in New Zealand. At that point, the population, total population was probably around 3 million. Mm-hmm. And New, Zealand are, New Zealanders are a very musical people, I believe, but they simply don't have the numbers. You've got 3 million people on 80 million sheep, uh, and, and sheep don't buy tickets to concerts. You, know, mm-hmm. you, don't, you, don't have, you don't have the audience in order to sustain a career. Um, but a very important thing happened and that was, um, wait for it, New Zealand, as it was the building of the Sydney Opera House. Okay. And the, in order to have a, um, a gala event, like for a year-long celebration of opening the Opera House, the, uh, the, the organizers in, in Sydney invited two of the great American orchestras to come and play concerts about a year apart. The Cleveland Orchestra was there, and then in 1974, the... New York Philharmonic uh, went to Sydney. At that point, the, uh, the the journey across the Pacific was a, a pretty arduous one. So both orchestras elected to stop off in New Zealand on the way. New Zealand's 
about three time zones away from Australia, 1,500 miles. I didn't realize that. And then they and and so they they stayed for a, for a week in New Zealand and gave concerts. And so there had been no foreign orchestra since the Czech Philharmonic had visited in the early 1950s, shortly before I was born. And this this was an incredible event for us because us young New Zealanders had never heard that quality of playing except on recordings. And it's an interesting interesting um, statement, I think, of the human condition that you can hear something played on the re- on a recording and it, it doesn't feel the same as when you're in the room with an actual musician playing it. Right. And it, I don't just mean that in terms of the musical nuance. I just mean that the whole sense of possibility. And so we could we could listen to a recording of the Cleveland Orchestra and and admire it, 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 its both its beauty and its precision and yet we wouldn't really think that that was how it really sounded in real life until we were we were actually there hearing the sound right uh, in in the room that and when I went to Cleveland because I made made those contacts I, I came over to Cleveland initially in 1976 um, I'd never heard an orchestra live that sounded better live than it did on the recordings right right and I think Chicago Symphony had that kind of reputation as well, um, that that you actually had to be in the room with this orchestra in order to fully appreciate um, just just what an orchestra truly could sound like. Right. So we made, we made contacts um, with with these American musicians from Cleveland and from New York, and and so I came over and went to first to Cleveland, and then after a year, I moved out to to New York and lived in New Haven actually, and that's where I started with the Sousa band research with with the Yale band. So did you do the uh, Cleveland Institute of Music or did you just come over and work privately in Cleveland? Well, I I worked with the immigration uh, system, which meant that I needed to be enrolled at a institution, which I did. I enrolled in the Cleveland Institute, but only only took trumpet lessons. I didn't take any classes or work towards a degree. Mm -hmm. At that point, I I had a degree. We We were talking about schooling and so forth. I, I had taken my degree in New Zealand in mathematics and pure mathematics. Okay. And that was really um, good for me in a, in a variety of ways, which we can talk about later if you'd like to. But the um, most important thing was I realized that I hadn't spent those thousands of hours that I needed to on my instrument. Right. Uh, and at that point, I was I was starting to play. I was making a very modest living, um, and I realized that I, I needed to give myself the exposure to that incredibly high standard of playing that was represented by by musicians in the United States. For our non-music l- listeners, they're they're probably thinking Cleveland for real. The guy comes to Cleveland, they'd have no idea that the Cleveland Orchestra is, you know, certainly in the top five of the American Orchestra at this point, maybe in the top two. And and you know, it's because George Zell was there and created this. Enclave, this musical nirvana or mecca uh, in in the Midwest, and then Yale. Pro- people probably don't realize that the the Yale Graduate School is extremely strong in in music, where the other Ivies and and music programs are, you know, middling at best. But but Yale has always had that that reputation for its graduate students. Um, and, That's true. There, and, there is no undergraduate degree in music uh, at, at Yale, but there's a lot of really talented, very bright young people. Right, and your math, Yale. your your math degree in composition it, it is really interesting. We will we will come come back to that. I remember that when I was in in the um, in the Buffalo Philharmonic, some of the guys, Don Harry, the tuba player from the orchestra, who was our uh, very second episode of this podcast. And Phil Christner and and Scott Snowden and some of the you know absolute top brass players in the orchestra started talking about your arrangements that they were playing down at Fredonia uh, for brass. And then you know he's not that bad a conductor too. I played for him in this and in that. And so you did start waving that baton more and more. You mentioned uh, Ithaca College. I think you were the conductor when I taught on a sabbatical for somebody there. Um, one year. You had the Fredonia Chamber Players, I saw from your notes, the Penfield Symphony. It, did you, 
did did you seek out something that was different than the trumpet? Did you have this feeling like I got this? I need to do something more challenging, like Jerry Schwartz talked about, or what was the what was the impetus for starting to lead ensembles, arrange for them, and eventually write your own pieces for concerts? Let me begin with a disclaimer, and that is that I came to the United States to study, as I mentioned, in Cleveland and then New York, and the principal trumpet player of the New York Philharmonic was Jerry Schwartz. Right. So I, 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 I was a trumpet student of, of Jerry's, and to this day I am a colleague of his at the Eastern Music Festival. Cool. Where he's the, he's the music director. So, so we have ma- maintained a lot of contact, but I never, ever got from Jerry the sense that I, too, could do the transition that he was about to make from trumpet to, to conducting. Um, conducting t- happened, I think, in, in the most logical way it possibly could for me, and that is that it grew out of chamber music experiences that I had with my colleagues, that is to say, without conductor, and um, I just had a knack for being able to diagnose certain ensemble problems and their solutions that we were having. You know, every every chamber group has the same sort of um, issues about, oh, we, we seem to be going much slower now than we started out. We, where did we lose tempo? Right. Especially in the soldier's and, and, tale that you mentioned before. Oh, my gosh. So, so, so uh, I, uh, I was asked by my colleagues to to conduct based on the fact that they, they could see that I, I had these um, diagnostic skills, I suppose you would have to say. Mm-hmm. And, and going way back to when, when we started this conversation, talking about my being assistant director of bands at Yale, but never conducting a note, when I went down to Tulsa Philharmonic to, to join the orchestra there, not having conducted a note, but having assistant director of bands on my resume, the conductor of the Tulsa Youth Symphony, um, a string player, Ron Wheeler, who was became the best man at my wedding, um, latched onto me as being the same sort of foil to him as a string player that I had been for Keith Bryan with the Yale Band and that I was a brass player who could help his brass play- hmm. players out. The only difference was that he actually let me conduct a piece or two. First of all, it was a brass piece, then it was a wind piece, and then it was a piece uh, for orchestra. And I was only in Tulsa for, for th- three years, and, and I've just encapsulated a, a whole three-year career <laughs> as, as a conductor. But I had started with the same leadership um, idea com- coming between my colleagues in the string department at, at the Tulsa Philharmonic, including Raji. Um, we started a group called Musica Regala, and we hired ourselves out as a little Baroque orchestra of uh, strings, obviously at the core of the orchestra. And um, if it was hot Christmas time, then ev- what, what your listeners may not know is there are many, many, many churches in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's the home of Oral Roberts University. It's, it's, um, a very, very evangelical town. Every single one of those churches, it seemed, did their own production of Messiah in mm-hmm. the holiday season. And each one of them wanted an orchestra. We were able to put together this little core group that um, could reliably play the piece um, for for each of the um, cho- choral conductors at each of the churches. And as you might imagine, their talents as conductors varied. Um, from from barely being able to get through the piece, but being able to conduct the chorus, it was good for them to have an, an orchestra that could basically um, play the piece. So we we had a, a little thing going there, mm-hmm. and and I I was um, the 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 head, I suppose, <laughs> certainly the contact person. So we, of the group. So when I went to Fredonia, which was immediately after Tulsa. Um, I had on my resume that I was the director of Musica Regala. So this was in the early 80s. I joined the faculty in Fredonia in 1982. And that was in in the midst of a terrible budget crunch for the SUNY system, uh, which each campus handled in its own way. The way Fredonia's president decided to go was if somebody leaves, we won't replace them. It didn't matter what their specialty was. Mm Mm-hmm. And so uh, at the end of my first year as trumpet professor at Fredonia, uh, James or Jim Smith got a job in Madison, Wisconsin as the wind ensemble director. And so they needed somebody from the faculty to just take on the wind ensemble, which was one of the premier ensembles of, of the School of Music at Fredonia. And I had this, this stuff on my resume, and I was, I was really, really 
um, up front with them, you know, I haven't actually conducted very much. They said, well, we just, we, we don't have any alternatives. Would, would you do it to help us out? So I was in a, in a situation where I was conducting a lot, like several hours a week of podium time. Yep. Um, and with a lot of, um, a lot of support from my colleagues because I was doing it just to be helpful. I wasn't doing it because I had this, I want to be a maestro kind of thing going for me, you know? Right. Um, we, we know those guys. We both of us know <laughs> we, those we guys. Do. <laughs> you know, I didn't buy a cape. I didn't uh -huh. do any of that stuff. Um, but, but I can remember even Buffalo Philharmonic coming down um, to, for, with a conductor who will remain nameless, but he had a cape. Oh, yes. I remember the yeah, person very well. I mean. Yeah, yeah we, we will not, not mention any names. Yeah. And, uh, and it wasn't um, Batman, by the way. It was not Batman. <laughs> but, but I was just a regular guy trying to help out. And, and concurrently then, um, Jim Smith had, had started with Jay East, the clarinet teacher at Fredonia, a group called the Fredonia Chamber Players, which was basically a faculty chamber orchestra. Well, with Jim's leaving, once again, there was a void there, and they said, would you help us out by, by conducting that? And that's really where I started playing. Uh, conducting, I mean, it, was, it led me to Buffalo, um, conducting Nutcracker, right. for example. Um, and uh, one thing just, just led to another, and I've never really had, and this maybe has had a bad effect on my quote unquote career. I don't know. I've never really had a plan of, of, of action from one step to the next. It's just seemed to have been um, a natural extension of what I was already doing. And so bit by bit. That's your mass. Um, that's your uh, mystery answer, by the way, Grant, that we're going to get to later. This is your host, John Hunter. If you, your group, your company would like to sponsor our music episodes, you can have an internal advertisement placed in the podcast. Please contact me at john, J-O-H-N, at jhunterservices.com. Stages to Success can be found on TuneIn Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or our RSS feed. The link can be found at www.stagestosuccesspodcast.com. Try telling your Amazon Echo to play it by commanding Play Stages to Success podcast. You're listening to an interview with Grant Cooper, formerly the music director of the West Virginia Symphony in Charleston. You never, quote unquote, studied conducting in a degree program. That's what I like best about your story because the greats, whether it's Toscanini, whether it's Klaus Tenstead, whether it's Van Bynum, whoever, they didn't study conducting either. They, right. they, they, they have the ears, they have the leadership skills, and, and hopefully they develop a baton technique. But sometimes even that's not necessary if you can hear, if you can make the changes. I love that. And you probably don't see the connection with the guy, but I do. The guy who does his own plumbing and electrical in the house, <laughs> and the guy who just says, "I can do this. G give yeah. me a stick. Give right? me that. Give <laughs> me that stick. I can fix your problems." I I really like. That's what I always really liked about you, Grant. I, and and your your story leads right to the the next question of uh, mine, which because I do remember the the first time I played for you was the Nutcracker when you came to the Buffalo Philharmonic, and I remember speaking with you about it because the the orchestra played it uh, at least early on. The orchestra played it when I was there in a very specific way because it had been conducted by Simeon Bitchkov, who had maybe the best recording in the world of the piece at that time with the Berlin Philharmonic. And he had been the music director. And I, I, I remember thinking, Grant seems fearless. I, he, he is going to do this. Uh, he is going to get up there and conduct this piece. And, and you did. And you did a really nice job. And I remember asking you, is that like a long shadow, you know, cast uh, across your path, you know, this is Bitchkov's orchestra. He maybe had been gone for one and a half years, maybe. And uh, how, did, did have you ever felt that in in other contexts? Like, you know, I just followed up a week that, uh, you know, you know, name the person. Uh, you know, Yoel Levy just conducted this past week, and and now here I am. Has that ever intimidated you, or uh, made you feel self conscious, or have you just gone and done it? Well, the uh, the scenario that you describe 
is very much apparent um, and was very much apparent to me during my 10 years as resident conductor of the Syracuse Symphony, because often what would happen is that a given week subscription concert would be conducted by the either the, the maestro, the music director, or by a high-level guest conductor. And then on Monday, the orchestra would come back. I'd have one rehearsal with them to do Brahms IV and Dvorak Cello Concerto, right. which they had just played with a different soloist, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, you, you really feel like you, you're, you're standing um, in, a, in, a, in a very long shadow. But, but what I found, John, there are, there are two points here I'd like to make. One, one about the Nutcracker itself, and the second, more generally, about this concept that we're talking about. But I think it's really important that you have a really well thought out and musically based um, interpretation for a piece, and and you actually do that interpretation and stick to it. You don't try to copy somebody else. Right. And most importantly, in Nutcracker. Now, Nutcracker must be along with Messiah uh, in the in the top five of of pieces that mus- musicians in the orchestra claim to hate playing. Yeah, well. Um, and, and because they do it so many times and so often. Right. And I, th- I think I had seen assistant conductors. I had played the Nutcracker for conductors who kind of went along with this. Oh, what a drag it is. Here we go again. What number is this for you? 155? Yeah, it's about 165 for me. What a drag that we have to do this yet again. Yeah, and it's, and, and that's then, like an act of complaining were, about Shakespeare. Don't blame me. I didn't write this stuff. Right? I mean, that's <laughs> nuts. Right. But but I, I made a decision very early on to conduct every performance, and I've conducted hundreds of performances of, of Nutcracker, and it's been true, including this past December when I went back to West Virginia and conducted it there that I conduct every performance like this is the greatest piece of music that is ever written Mm -hmm. and that I do not want to be anywhere else but in the pit right now playing this piece. Mm -hmm. And when I finally left um, Syracuse after after the 10 years, as I mentioned, um, and we did our last Nutcracker together, a a number of players came up to me and said, you know, we really appreciate the fact that you really did invest every ounce of your musical body into every performance that we've played with you. Right. And over a hundred of them by, by that time. Um, and, and so, so, so players, I think want to play in an inspired way, but the worst thing you can do as a conductor is to kind of want to be one of the boys, one of the buddies and, and, and um, pretend that you too uh, think that this is a drag. Right. When we were back and forth on the questions, what I meant about, your career expanding so fast where, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, a lot of people won't realize that you were writing piece, entire pieces of, uh, for children's music concerts, it, it completely originally composed music. You were doing all these arrangements in addition to waving the baton. And what I'd written to you about of being able to afford it is that doesn't pay as well as going out and doing other jobs here or there. So how did, how was it that you, devoted your your time to creative things that you were doing and and decide, you know what, I'm going to write a piece about, it was a, a Little Red Riding Hood, right? Is that the first one we did with you? I can't remember the order, but the, the Little Red Riding Hood is a piece called Boys in the Wood. Right, and that must have been hundreds of hours of work for you, if not into the thousands. How did you decide, I'm going to invest this time? Did you have a paid commission? Did you just say this is going to be part of my contract? That that fascinates me. Gosh, how do I start um, the answer to that question? Uh, it goes back, I think, to my high school days where I had a wonderful music teacher who was kind of like Father Bach to to us music uh, nerds, and and that he believed that if you were a musician, you not only played your instrument, but you, of course, you composed. Right, I, I arranged, but were you paid? I, I'm getting on just no. to the sheer economics. No, 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 and and probably I have been paid very well for some things that um, have helped subsidize my uh, my passion in, in other areas. But almost always, my desire to write a piece of music has come from a need to have a piece of music. Right. So I wanted to create for my own use. And anyone else who wants to play, and everyone's welcome to, to play these other pieces. But I, I did three major pieces. Um, the one you mentioned, the Little Red Riding Hood story, which I call Boys in the Wood, where Little Red Riding Hood is a coloratura soprano and the wolf is a rap singer. 
Uh, I did a Song of the Wolf, which is the story of the three little pigs, but the wolf is an environmentalist, and I used oh, a yeah. singer from the Adirondacks right, for that. Right, right. And then, you see, this is how things start to happen. Then, to go to your question, I started to get commissions. Mm. And so, so the Cayuga Chamber Orchestra down in Ithaca, New York, I was in Ithaca at the time, um, I had done a, a, a performance with them of a, of a 10-minute piece I've written. The other ones are 30, 30 minutes of full length programs um the 10 minute piece of goldilocks and the three bears well they had someone who who wanted to um, support expanding their education program and they said can we commission you to write a a new piece of music for us which i said sure you can and i wrote the the biggest piece i've done i guess and it's just just for orchestra and narrator uh called rumpelstiltskin sure i remember that very well yeah so um and and the fact is that I got those pieces done. I wrote them for the Cayuga Chamber Orchestra, Rumpelstiltskin. They wanted a, a instrumental quintet version they could take into the schools cheaply. And they wanted a chamber orchestra version with single winds, um, which I wrote for them. But then I realized that the piece itself had enough uh, musical ideas in it to be, to be worthy of expanding to a full orchestra. And so when, when, for example, the Miller's daughter offers the ring from her finger, I take off on, on Wagner's ring, ring and, and have right. this Siegfried-like horn solo, which um, in the in the original version is a, is a horn solo, but in the full orchestra version that goes um, with a nod to Richard Strauss and uh, Alpine Symphony with a, with a trio of horns off stage and, and so forth. And the kids love this. They love the spatial aspect and, and, and so on. And I also tried in all of my pieces to create interactive elements for the children themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not to get into any of any of those nitty gritty details, but when the kids have a role to play and are, are responding to musical stimuli that they hear, then there are there are valuable lessons in that as well. But the the point I want to make is that I started out with the instrumental quintet, a chamber orchestra version, then a full orchestra version, and this probably John took four or five years to accomplish. Wow. Uh, and and once I got the piece tweaked to where I really liked it, that's when I did my final version. Um, which I've played now dozens of times um, of, of each of these pieces in rotation. And do you do you uh, do you see the connection with your uh, fellow totally famous founder of the Yale Music Department there, Paul Hinnemuth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what you're talking about is Gebrauch's music, right? You're talking about yeah. does is yeah. it? I need something for a specific set. I, I remember singing uh, uh, as a performer in Let's Build a Town, that this tiny opera that he wrote for a town that didn't have the financial resources to do a full opera. And, and I, 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 I see the connection. It must be you Yale guys. It must be something in the water in New Haven. I worked with you over a period of three years uh, at, at when you were our associate conductor in the Syracuse Symphony. Your, your notes said that you had over 600 concerts. Um, I, my wife was on the committee that chose you. And, and when, when she came back, she remarked about this guy from New Zealand. I knew exactly who you were because I had already worked with you. Uh, yeah, for right. a, You were a new commodity, I think, for Karen. She'd heard about you from Ithaca. And, and they asked everybody the same question. Uh, and and your answer stuck out in her mind, and it's it really resonates in my business career and with the entrepreneurs that I speak with. They 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 asked, "What is your plan, Grant? Do you have a professional plan? What you know? What is where do you see yourself in five years?" And there were a lot of canned answers, and there were. Uh, there were conductors who, you know, talked about their personal life, and I, I, I found myself divorced. I still remember Karen being just so offended by that answer uh, from this person. But you said, I don't have a plan. Whatever comes in front of me, you know, basically, I just want to do my best. And as life comes, I take it and I try to excel something along those lines i'm not giving it verbatim but she came back and talked about that she said there's this guy who just said he's from new zealand he said i don't have a plan and i said i love that i mean this is before i was ever involved in business and i hear this all the time from successful entrepreneurs what what needed to be fixed what it what was the part what was the problem 
that needed to be solved, right? And that's why mm-hmm. my company is hired as a commercial real estate broker. We got to solve that real estate problem. We got to solve that distribution, that showroom, that you know, multiple offices where people aren't communicating or whatever it is. And then you came. You were hired. I'm glad you were hired. And you did over six. I, I am too. You did over six hundred concerts. And now here's the here's the dark part of my interview. Uh, that there is just like what you talked about this associate conductor stigma that you get. You have limited time. You're you're going to be doing a bunch of children's concerts. You're going to be doing this repertoire that's uh, that musicians are overexposed to, and familiarity breeds contempt, both for the conductor and for the peace. But, you know, somehow the Messiah carries on. I just, you know, I don't know how, but, uh, you know, it is arguably the most important music in all of Western civilization. And I'm sure that a second doesn't go by in a century that it's not being performed or practiced anywhere on earth. I mean, there, there cannot be one second where it's not being listened to, played, or practiced. Um, but you, in that chair with the musicians having this kind of, mm, you know, contempt for the associate conductor. That's It's just part and parcel of the job, seemingly. You handled that as graciously as anybody I ever saw in 13 years. Just And maybe it's because you focused, just like you said, I wouldn't, there, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than conducting Peter in the Well for the 40th time here, Right. Or whatever it is. Did you? How did you, in your mind's eye, for our our business listeners, maybe who are thinking, "Hey, I'm the vice president of this company. Uh, everybody knows I'm not the CEO, or I just took over as interim CEO, and everybody knows I'm not here for the long haul." And there's a lot of contempt from the regulars. How did you, in your mind's eye, deal with that role before you became the big cheese in Charleston? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, um, as with any big question like that, that there are several facets to it. But I, I think the fact that um, I was not trying to build a career, uh, I already, in a sense, had a career. Wherever I, wherever I was, I was able to move to the next thing um, and transition between the two of them and kind of... Um, not really leave anywhere. That's a very uh, zen. That's very zen, Grant. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it was. It was. I was very fortunate in, in that I was able, able more or less to do that. And the other the other thing is that going back to the the degree in mathematics, um, when when we talk about mathematics in the United States, most people are, are talking about arithmetic um, numbers and and the way they relate to each other. But when when you're actually doing real mathematics. Um, you haven't just taken an algebra course and then you know the fin- final is going to be on questions on algebra or a calculus course where all of the, all of the questions on the final are going to be in calculus. Instead, you're presented with this mathematical system which is defined and you're seeing for the very first time at the exam and you're asked how the objects in this mathematical system, they may not be numbers, they may be functions, how do they relate to each other? How do they behave around the the, uh, the the number zero? Often the most interesting part of any function is how it behaves around zero. So when you're confronted with a problem like that, John, on a, on a final exam, it's a three-hour exam, there are three questions or three different systems that you're going to deal with in three hours. You, you, you don't know for sure whether you need to use algebra or calculus or whatever other things or whatever other tools you have. You have to, first of all, figure out what is the problem. Mm-hmm. How, how do I bring to bear um, on solving this problem all of my experience? The first thing I have to do is figure out what is the problem itself. And I, I think that if you portray that kind of attitude on the podium, to bring it back to answer your, answer your question, you have a lot less risk as an associate conductor as seeming to be, well, you're not the big guy, you don't really... Um, have the power over me. You don't have the hiring and firing and so forth. You're simply just being a musician. And so long as you are asking people to consider um, the way they're playing relative to a musical request, um, I think you, you, 
you, you get a lot more out of them because you reawaken in a, in a lot of orchestral players their original reasons for becoming musicians. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so so I, I, when I'm on the podium, for example, I consciously do not use words like loud or soft because I, or short or long because I don't, I don't think loud is a musical concept. Um, and loud is what, what the effect you get when you're standing next to a jet engine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, there, there are, there've got to be other ways which invite imagination to be used by, by, by your listeners. And, and sometimes they laugh at you. And I remember, I remember when I was in Syracuse and Daniel Hege joined, um, the organization as music director, and he had just come from the Baltimore symphony. I remember Jim so Ritano well. was there. And, and, and he, he said, you know, he was doing this Mozart symphony and and he stopped the orchestra this is termikanov in, in baltimore stopped the orchestra and said ladies and gentlemen this forte it should smile mm-hmm. and daniel said to me can you imagine if we said to a bunch of professional musicians this forte should smile that laugh us off the stage right right termikanov had the standing and and the respect um to uh t- to be able to say that and i thought that's that's a really really interesting comment. The other the other interesting thing that I tried to apply to my conducting was I, I watched a, a video of, of Chili Padaki conducting in in Munich, mm-hmm. and um, it, it was a piece. I think it, I think it was the, the classical symphony of Prokofiev, and he's conducting away, and he stops and he says, "Why are you changing tempo?" And I thought. Gosh, if I said that to the Syracuse Symphony, they'd just say we're just following you. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but but in fact, in, in, in pl- implicit and in in, in Chalipadaki's addressing them like that was this is your responsibility. Mm-hmm. And what I found over the years, John, is that as a conductor, by giving players the room to be responsive and responsible and interpretive and imaginative musicians, you actually, all of the stuff that you were referencing goes away. So I would say that for a business uh, model, uh, the, the leadership qualities that, that the leader should bring is, is a sense of um, respect and trust mm-hmm. for people whom you're trying to get to the, the, the very best out of and, and an ex- ex- expectation that they are going to be great. Yeah. You know, that, that this this really really sounds, um, or, or the whole organism is is responding to everybody's participation in a very positive way. So when you got to the big chair in Charleston, and 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 then you are the hirer and firer, you're the top of the food chain. Uh, did did you process it differently in, in your mind? Did you feel like like I did when I was a college teacher and after being a private teacher, I had the tyranny of the grade, I called it. They that that gave me some power over their practice habits that I didn't have as a, a private instructor where I just had to inspire them to practice. Um did did the assumption of music director change your your positional dealings with your players in your mind in your mind i i know it would in their mind but i mean in your mind well i in my mind i did go to charleston to to take over the west virginia symphony orchestra in 2001 um i went there with a pretty firm goal in my mind and that was to test an hypothesis hypothesis that that we've been referencing um uh, throughout this talk today uh, and, and that is that there seemed to be in all the orchestras I had been involved with a hierarchy of importance of certain types of concerts. There was at the top of the food chain the music director conducting Beethoven Nine on a subscription concert. Right. Uh, and um, and then you went down from there to the the routine pieces that we've referenced: Messiah, Nutcracker, Holiday Pops. Uh, and and then you got to the children's concerts, the educational concerts, where at, at least in many of the orchestras I'd been associated with, you would find the principal players wouldn't play. Correct. Uh, they would they would get relief from that, and certainly the music director wouldn't conduct. And so it was very easy for those concerts to be characterized by the players as being way down on the food chain. And so I said to myself as I went down to to Charleston, West Virginia, what would happen? 
if I, as the music director, conducted everything. That every time we were on the, on the stage together, every time we were rehearsing, no matter what it was, it could be a, a children's program or it could be um, Beethoven 9, we are going to be working towards making the West Virginia Symphony Orchestra the, the organization that we all hope it will become um, eventually in its, in its history. And we will, we will spend that 15 minutes at the end of a children's concert rehearsal and work on the orchestra's basic ensemble. Uh, even though as a resident conductor or as, a, as a, an associate conductor, you get to the end of a rehearsal, you don't go back on that stuff, do you, John? You no, say, okay, you're done early. Gentlemen, I trust you, we're gonna, we'll, we'll get out early. Oh, bravo, great maestro, we'll get out early. So I found that, in, that it worked. Did you actually do that? Were you waving the baton for every minute of their playing for a while? Well, I ended up uh, over, over 16 years doing 800 performances with the West Virginia Symphony Orchestra. What did Very you say? What times. did you say no to then, Grant? What 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 did you have to take a pass on because you didn't have an underling conductor do it? Okay, well now we get to, now we get to the dark side of things because what I didn't do is I did not develop a um, a podium swap policy. I did not develop um, through an agent a, a whole bunch of guest conducting. Um, and put this podium swap, you know how that works. You, you conduct my orchestra and let me conduct your orchestra. Right, and sometimes uh, it's and, great, and most times it ain't. Yeah, it's it, well, it's being done for the wrong reason. Is, mm-hmm. is, is the problem with it? Um, so the very few guest conductors we had, we had people like Jerry Schwartz come down and um, wow, and, and conduct the West Virginia Symphony, and that was a, a real uh, shot in the arm for the orchestra. Of course, by doing everything, you run the risk of. Um, seeming to uh, be just regurgitating the same ideas after a while. Mm -hmm. And the 16 years that I spent at West Virginia, um, I don't think that I got into trouble in that regard. Um, Certainly, the orchestra continued to play better and better, and I think the players themselves really responded to that. The goal is to make the musical experience so overwhelmingly positive that there is really no question that people will try to play with you. And in, indeed, I think it's, it would be fair to say that that worked for us over, over my tenure in, in West Virginia, that we were able to get a, a high degree of loyalty on the players. And that was, goes back to another question of the hiring and firing aspect of when you're the big cheese. You, know, you, you don't set out that I'm here and I'm going to fire anybody who doesn't come up to my standards. And it used to be that that would work. Maybe George Zell built the Cleveland Orchestra on that kind of basis. Maybe Fritz Reiner in Chicago sure. maybe had a similar kind of influence. Absolutely. What I was trying to do, though, John, was I was trying to get people to feel that, that they were inspired by the music and, and that they would therefore give their very best um, as a result of that. And I think it was due to the fact that, that I could really honestly show that through my own personal behavior, my own sense of being prepared, um, the fact that I was writing music for these players... Um, that, that this this was going to be a, a, a fundamentally a musical experience. They would choose our orchestra. We would build the orchestra that way, and and I think I think it was successful. Well, what you're talking about is is a, a very classic paradigm shift of the conductor of the 20th century versus the 21st, and you're the collaborative 21st century conductor, and the tyrannical conductor of the especially the early 20th century had a few things working. For him, the unions were not strong. Tenure was not instituted. And also there was a uh, sort of the, the old model, and especially the United States, that industrial, tycoon, aristocratic, all-powerful tyrant. And, um, you know, what I noticed was that the classical music world was sort of the last vestige of that as I started in the, the 1980s. Um, and it's pretty much gone away now. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's... I'm sure there's your occasional uh, foreign conductor who's come out of a you know a particularly tyrannical system and upbringing that would like to bring it here, but they don't they don't get to work that way. You mentioned that you you haven't played the trumpet since '93. Uh, at 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 each stage of being more busy as a conductor, learning new scores. Have you had to leave other stuff behind? Has it been a long time since you arranged for brass? Has it been a long time since you wrote an original piece? Uh, 
you know, what what are some of the things that have had to go by the the wayside? Well, I'm I am a music nerd in a way because not only my profession but all of my hobbies are musical. Uh, that includes sound editing. Mm-hmm. For example, I still produce CDs for for people. Oh, that's fun. Um, I'm uh, I'm conducting less now, but composing a lot more. And uh, I'm just applying the the same principle that we've talked about already in this interview that that I don't have a plan. Mm-hmm. All I do is go from one exciting project to the next. And what I found, and this goes back to that mathematical. Um, equivalence that I that I tried to establish a little bit earlier is that there is no limit to the possibility of of a given project and, and what it can mean in terms of your involvement in it. And the the time opens up, you fill it with with that possibility. So I just did a Messiah with the Cayuga Chamber Orchestra last December. Mm-hmm. And even though I had my own set of parts that were marked and I looked at the markings, it said nineteen eighty three. So 35 years mm-hmm. I've been using this set of parts. Mm-hmm. I decided, because I had the time, to go back and begin again on, on Messiah and, and get a new set of parts and mark them afresh with new bowings, new articulations. Mm-hmm. And I, I just spent time that I, did, I wouldn't have had uh, were I still really busy conducting. Yeah. And by the way, Grant, you know, Handel's Messiah, that's worth taking another shot at, you know? <laughs> I, 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 I think I the think music can it. tolerate the the excessive analysis. Well, I, I can I can tell you a story about Messiah that um, that resonated on a on a recent interview that I was doing, where I said it's it's an amazing piece because when you do the whole thing, it's about three hours, mm-hmm. and every time I conduct the whole thing, I get to the last amen, and I say, oh, I'm so sorry that this is over. Yeah, I just want I just want this arc continue forever. Well, I'm going to attempt this June at the Bach and Beyond Festival that I direct in Fredonia, New York, uh, to do a full-length Messiah with a total of four singers. Doable. In fact, by scaling it down where the soloists sing the choral, the chorus parts as well, yep. one on a part, that everything will have an incredible transparency to it. Now, mm-hmm. am I saying this is the only way to do this piece? Absolutely not. Right. Uh, um, and I may say I will never do this again. Mm-hmm. I'm trying it. But I have found in the course of the more than 20 years we've been doing this Bach and Beyond Festival that c- treating m- music of, of, of any era um, with a sense of transparency mm-hmm. is often an amazingly revealing experience. And especially when we're talking now about Baroque music and, and, and Bach, the transparency is what enables one to hear the incredible art of the of the counterpoint and so forth. If we right. play it to to sustain, like a Sousa march, going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, a Sousa march just played forte all the way through by everybody. It starts to all sound like um, like like one soup. I think a great piece of music can withstand the extremes because it's a great piece of music. The question is, are is the conductor and are the performers committed to it? And I'm sure yours will be. Your four singers may, you know, have some very sore throats for the next two weeks, but they'll do it. <laughs> I'll let you know. Okay. Grant, it's been such a, a privilege and pleasure speaking with you. You're an you're amazingly articulate person, and I've, I've known that my whole life. And uh, I'll put, if, if you'll send me, um, you know, links to your upcoming concerts, projects, recordings that you've produced, they'll go along with the podcast episodes and our you know our listeners can follow what you're doing and congratulations on the new grandkids grandkid oh, yeah. and life, life changing yeah Definitely. and you know you've moved back uh you know to your to your roots in new york for you know the the post virginia career i think I, I love it up there i love how beautiful it is and congratulations most of all as a conductor the 38 years of marriage is that what you said 38 yeah, it's going yeah. to be 38 in October, yeah. I think. We're yeah. 30, and uh, dude, you're a, you're a very rare commodity, not only in the music world, but especially in the conducting world. It's like, you guys... Well, thank you. I'm so pleased to speak with you. Thanks for your time and, and uh, for being on Stages to Success. 
My pleasure. Thank you. Ah, thanks, Grant. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Grant Cooper, native New Zealander, who is the associate conductor of the Syracuse Symphony and music director of the West Virginia Symphony in Charleston. I'm your host, John Hunter, digital editing and technical assistance from Monty Scott, and recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media at Navy Pier. Join us again for People and Stories from the Worlds of the Symphony Orchestra and Commercial Real Estate for our next episode of Stages to Success.